Chapter Twelve of Hints for Lovers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Hints for Lovers by Theodore Arnold Halton. Chapter Twelve On Engagements and on Being Engaged. Chalapon to May Philosi, Chalapon to Kai Philosi. Anna Creon. Perhaps the pleasantest and most satisfactory period in a girl's life is the time of her first youthful engagement. Never is a girl more jubilant, never more buoyant, never so charming, so blithesome, or so debonair, as when she is the gazetted about-to-be bride of the man of her girlish choice. For during her engagement a girl is owned and petted, and ownership and petting are dear to women, whether young or old. Ownership is proof at all events that she is of value to the man else the man would not sought to make her his and petting is proof that the man properly appreciates the value yet meanwhile anomalous as it may sound the engaged girl is still her own property and is practically free besides what more delectable to a girl than to have captured and kept a real man this flatters her uplifts her makes of her a woman at once she holds her head higher she carries herself with an air she shows off her capture besides also the engaged girl is looked up to by her compeers is congratulated by her elders even if she keeps the engagement secret these compeers and congratulatresses do not sometimes alas to her detriment in addition to all this what delight so unique as the preparation of the trousseau trousseau it is a name of mystical import to man a woman's trousseau is symbol of two things and perhaps dimly indicative of a third one it proves what needs no proof that such is the unselfish nature of love never can it give enough never enhance too much the gifts it gives accordingly the bride goes to the man apparelled and bedecked to the best of her ability two it is a subtle tribute to the sensibility of man of the man in love who is stimulated and pleased by dainty it may be diaphanous raiment lastly since even that supernal thing love is not unconcerned with matters practical three it bespeaks a prophetic suspicion of the little fact that perhaps it is well to go to her husband's home abundantly provided with dainty raiment inasmuch as the man not in love is not always so delicately sensible of their need. A girl's first engagement is peculiarly sweet. Long does she remember, long meditatively dwell upon, its pettiest incidents. For, if any man dared give utterance to so outrageous an assumption, the emollients of a promise to marry are as sweet to the donatress as undoubtedly they are to the acceptor. And why not, pray? Nevertheless, a certain practical sobriety supervenes upon subsequent affairs of the heart. For the recurrence of love is apt to spoil its romance. And yet, and yet, it is a question which woman after woman has put herself, in vain, whether it would have been wiser to have accepted and retained the romantic love of unthinking youth, or to have waited for the more sober affection of the years of discretion. Perhaps a girl hardly knows all that is meant by that thing called love, or what is entailed upon her by that thing called an engagement. She has played with love so much that when a real and serious love is offered her, she still thinks it the toy that amused her. But soon enough does the man, if he is in earnest, and a man never proposes unless he is in earnest, enlighten the girl of his choice. For to a man love is never a toy though mere lust may be. Men never play with love, as do girls. They play with lust, as they play with bats and balls and firearms. When men fall in love, they fall in love with a vengeance, and the seriousness with which the man falls in love startles the girl. The man demands so much, is so exacting, so preemptory, so unyielding, so frightfully selfish, so terribly jealous of the slightest look, or smile or gesture bestowed upon any other than he that the girl well the girl probably begins to think either that the man is an unreasonable brute 
or that her girlish notions of love are somewhat astray. Then one of two things happens. Either the man goes off in a huff, or the girl mends her ways. The recurrence of love is a great shock to love. Love thinks itself a thing unique, unalterable, supreme, a thing not made out of the flux and chains of earthly affairs, but heaven-born and descended from the skies. That it should go and come seems to destroy the fundamental conception of love. The affianced man thinks he has won him the sweetest, the most sacrosanct thing that ever trod God's earth outside of Eden, a bundle of blisses, a compact little mass of exquisite mysteries, whose every tint and curve and motion are to him sources of wonderment and delight. He is at once humbled and exalted. He thanks high heaven for the gift. He looks into his heart to find whether he can comport himself worthy of such gift for that this wondrous and mysterious little thing called a woman should of her own accord put herself in his arms, to be by him, and by him alone, cherished and nurtured till death them do part. This indeed gives the male heart a very sobering, a very ennobling thrill, for beneath the heaving breast he so passionately loves, behind the eyes into the depths of which he so passionately looks, there stirs, he knows, that ineffable, that indefinable thing, a woman's heart, and that to him has been committed the keeping of that heart. This rouses in him the manly virtues as no other thing rouses them. Strong is the man who can live up to these emotions, sage the woman who knows what she has aroused. The philanderer or the flirt, to whom love-making and love-taking have been a pastime, is appalled at the seriousness of love when real love is offered him or her, for often enough the philanderer, or the flirt, thinks compliments and cajolery the food of love. In time they discover that love is a veritable sarcophagus. Many an accepted lover, both masculine and feminine, tries to make up for coldness of passion by warmness of affection, a subterfuge of dubious efficacy. For though affection seeks affection, passion is only appeased by passion. Yet when one loves passionately, and the other languidly accepts, it is well perhaps for that other sometimes to be a little unfaithful to the truth, and to simulate an unfelt ardour. But always this is of questionable value, for love abhors simulation of anything, even of ardour. If mutual confidence is not established at the moment of betrothal, it will never afterwards be established and woeful be the plight of those between whom mutual confidence is not then established, for mutual confidence is the only atmosphere in which love can breathe. An engaged man, like a hungry man, is an irascible man. And how often a fiancé is sore put to it, not only to satisfy him, but to pacify him. A woman will often blandly ask why the two rivals to her hand should not be friends, yet it is significant of much that she does her utmost to keep them apart. Indeed, in no instance are a woman's tact and finesse so exercised as in playing off one man against another. And yet usually she delights in the task, for being made love to is to women what killing, whether of men or of animals, is to men. In a word, to be sought after is to woman what war or the chase is to man. The moment a woman accepts a man, then and there he becomes her lord and master, and this she unconsciously knows, nay, expects. If the man does not then and there exercise his lordship, and show his mastery, he will find it difficult to do it later on. But of course no woman will ever be got to admit that her newly won man is her master. Nevertheless, it is counsel that every man should lay to heart, for, unless a woman is dominated, and be not dominated over, she tries to get the upper hand, and only two instances there are in which the woman should retain the upper hand, when the man is either a philosopher or a fool. When a man is both, and the combination is not uncommon, she would be a fool if she did not retain the upper hand. But little does a woman esteem him who does not sway, nay, who does not sacrifice, it may be, her to his will of that engaged pair who can confidingly speak the one to the other of the dawn of their mutual attraction, little need be feared. 
if they cannot, very much may be feared. For love, without confidence, is as defunct as faith without works. For if M cannot confide in N, it probably means that K and L have, or that O and P will. So tremendous are the results of the gift of self, that nature herself seems to have ordained that the feminine sacrifice shall be utter and complete. For a man's interests may be many and diverse. The chase, the combat, the adventure, the struggle of life, and woman has but one, her family. And only through the woman is the man bound to the family. And since the family is ultimately dependent upon the man, the importance a woman attaches to the binding potency of her charms is as natural and legitimate as it is utilitarian and beneficial. Many more women, and perhaps also many more men, are entrapped into an engagement than would be willing to avow it. Yet every girl thinks that, given the chance, she can get any man. But few girls go to the trouble of thinking whether they can keep the man when got. Yet how to keep the man she has got, this gives many an engaged girl food for thought. Many a woman has set her cap at a man from pique at the detractions of a rival. But how she has rued it! But indeed, how many engagements are brought about by anything rather than love? How engagements come about no man or woman shall tell. They are more inconsequent, more lawless, than the wind which bloweth where it listeth. Sometimes a girl who has failed to get or to keep the man she wanted, in a rage or in a huff, or to show that she does not want for lovers, or in sheer desperation, will engage herself again on the shortest notice and on the shallowest grounds. Sometimes a girl will engage herself to a man simply because another and rival girl was wanting that said man. Sometimes a shy man and a reserved maid will eat out their hearts with longing. When lo and behold, a bold girl will appear and carry off the shy man, perhaps to the lifelong chagrin and sorrow of all three. Often a hue, how often, an awkward and unsophisticated youth and a prim maid with downcast eyes will sit together, valse together, and the one never get one inch the nearer to the other, though soul and mind and body crave a closer union. The youth would give the solid earth, nay, the solid earth would be as naught, to gain him the courage to clasp the maiden to his breast. Yet so intense his awe, he would not strain a spider's web to risk the maid's good will. The maid, who shall say what passes in her mind? That the youth should adventure she could wish, yet his very hesitancy bespeaks his devotion true. Were he to fall about her neck, embrace her close, and demand the kiss of love, most like she would recoil aghast at first. Yet if he desisted, she would also recoil aghast. What should he do, poor awkward youth? What she? One thing onlookers will do, smile and simper and smile again. But in their inmost heart of hearts, they will envy that awkward youth, that simple maid. For because, in this, the first symptoms of unsolicited and reciprocal love, they will recognize something of the divine and mystical nature of love itself, of love untrammeled by convention or law, of love itself in its purity, its intensity, its diffidence, its terrifying, yet restraining force. Ah, love, not in every conflict art thou victor crowned. End of chapter 12